Howdy folks, and welcome back to World of Warships with Rear Admiral Jingles, and today we're featuring a replay. Replay? <laughs> That's not the word. Bloody hell, Jingles, it's your language. Learn how to speak it. Today we're featuring a replay uh, from Gamebred TV in the German Tier 10 heavy cruiser, the Hindenburg. Gamebred TV, by the way, is the artist formerly known as Runner 357. He's a former Swedish Marine and the creator of a certain meme that you may have seen do in the round shortly after the introduction of the carrier rework. Some great advice there, Runner. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm sure all the destroyer captains are grateful. Right, anyway, so the Hindenburg. You know, I can remember when the German cruisers were first introduced into the game, and the general consensus of opinion was that the Hindenburg was amazing. I can remember playtesting this thing before the cruisers were actually properly introduced and thinking to myself, this, this ship is just incredible, I have to get it. And the main reason why I thought it was so incredible at the time was because stealth firing in open water was still a thing. Now, if you can't remember what that was, allow me to explain. You see, at the moment, whenever you fire your guns, it doesn't matter what your surface detection range is. It blooms to whatever the range of the guns are, but that never used to be the case. Now, a modern Hindenburg is a bad example, because the numbers were different back then. But it'll do, just for illustration purposes. You can see that Runner... I should probably get used to calling him Gamebred TV now, but it'll always be Runner 357 in my eyes. Uh, his Hindenburg has a surface detection range of 12.6 kilometers, but his guns have a range of 17.8. So back in the day, before the stealth firing changes, as long as you were more than 12.6 kilometers away from the nearest enemy ship, you could shoot at anything further away than that, out to the maximum range of your guns, and they wouldn't be able to see you, regardless of whether or not they had line of sight. The Hindenburg and the Rune at Tier 9 were one of the few cruisers in the game that could actually do this. So I was determined to grind out and unlock my Hindenburg. And of course, the stealth firing changes came in before I could do that. Nevertheless, it was still a very powerful Tier 10 heavy cruiser, although at the time it only really had to compete with the Des Moines and the Zell because they were the only other Tier 10 heavy cruisers in the game. But Wargaming's almighty spreadsheet said that the Hindenburg was overperforming, and so they nerfed the reload of the guns. And they literally did this two days before I finally unlocked my Hindenburg. Not that I'm bitter about it or anything. Oh no. Um, I have a habit of doing this, by the way. The same thing happened in World of Tanks when I was grinding out the M48 pattern, which was, and let's be honest, a bit overpowered. And then in the very same week that I was about to unlock it for myself, World of Tanks announced five, count them, five separate nerfs for the M48. Shit. Top tip, if I ever announce that I'm grinding out a particular tech tree in a game, stay away from it, <laughs> okay? <laughs> because it's going to get hit with the nerf hammer. Well, anyway. Since then, the game has moved on quite a bit. There are all kinds of new cruisers in the high tiers. And Wargaming finally acknowledged that the Hindenburg had been power creeped a little. So, a couple of months ago, I think in December, they announced that the heal consumable for both the Hindenburg and the Rune was going to get an extra charge, which helped. But what really seems to have made a difference to the fortunes of the Hindenburg is the much more recent, just last month, reload buff. So, basically, the ship's more or less back to where it was before they started fucking around with it. Yes, this ship now has a sub-10 second reload. Now, it's never going to beat the Des Moines for raw rate of fire, but the Hindenburg has three more guns than the Des Moines of the same calibre, better armour, and torpedoes. And quite frankly, considering he's up against the gearing, Puerto Rico, Kremlin, Montana, Yoshino, and another Hindenburg, and the only other support he has on this flank is that Harugamo over there. Now, he's requested that the Harugamo down there gets out of that smoke screen and spots targets, and to his credit, the Harugamo understands that he absolutely needs to do that. I think his decision may have been encouraged by the sudden and extremely unwelcome appearance of what I think are Yoshino torpedoes. Because, as we all know, smoke screens are torpedo magnets, and if you're sitting inside the smoke screen and there's nobody in front of you to spot for you, you're not going to see those torpedoes until it's far, far too late. So, the Harugamo was once again spotting. 
not quite sure what's going on with all of those enemy ships. They appear to be heading in the wrong direction. <laughs> Don't they know? Well, they might not know that they outnumber uh, runner's team on this flank by six to three. But, well, you could look at the minimap and take an educated guess. Are they all really that afraid of the Harugamo's torpedoes? Has no one told them the Harugamo only has one torpedo launcher? Well, okay, yeah, it's got a torpedo reload booster as well, so 12 torpedoes at the most, once every two and a half minutes? Three minutes? What's wrong with you people? Get out there and fight! Well, never interrupt the enemy when they're making a mistake. It's incredibly bad manners. There's the first kill. They're down two ships, actually. The, uh, the friendly midway seems to have gifted the enemy gearing some free detonation flags, <laughs> so... <laughs> I shouldn't be laughing. Uh, carrier dive bombers against destroyers. So much fun. But, well, you know, if you're not going to run a detonation flag these days, you're definitely asking for it, especially in a destroyer. And on the bright side, if you've run out of detonation flags, you can soon expect to be earning some. For those of you who don't play World of Warships and have no idea what I'm talking about, you earn detonation flags by getting detonated. <laughs> so, <laughs> if you don't have any, don't worry, you'll soon earn some. I have to admit, I'm still wondering exactly what it is these guys are all afraid of. I mean, I know the Harugamo is quite scary, but it's not that scary. It's just one Harugamo in a Hindenburg. There's a Yamato cruising around on the back line. And nobody wants to get hit by a Yamato, but they're going to get hit a lot more just sailing around in circles on the far side of the island than they would if they just push forward and start sinking things. So, yeah, your guess is as good as mine. Now, there it is. There's the Iron Strike talent activated. So, if the coloured shell tracers weren't enough of a giveaway, the fact that the Iron Strike talent just activated after achieving 140... Yeah, I know. <laughs> already 140 main battery gun hits means that the Hindenburg's already impressive reload has just been buffed by a further 7.5%. It's actually down to just over 7 seconds now. At this point you have to start wondering, what's the point of the Des Moines again? Because <laughs> the thing about the Des Moines uh, was that its batteries of 8 inch guns are served by an auto-loading mechanism which is why it has like a five second reload. Now mathematics is not my strong suit here, but I'll have a stab at it. So if the Des Moines has nine guns and the high explosive shells do an average 2,800 damage and it's firing every 5.5 seconds, that gives the Des Moines a theoretical maximum high explosive damage per minute of 275,000. The Hindenburg whose shells do less damage, only two and a half thousand, but it has three more guns and is now firing every 7.2 seconds, is not far off with 250,000 high explosive damage per minute. And it has torpedoes. And it has better armor. It doesn't have radar, of course. But then again, it's got a way better hydroacoustic search than the Des Moines has access to. So, yeah. Of course, these are very specific circumstances. You have to have Gunter Lutyens as the captain, uh, and you have to unlock the Iron Strike talent by scoring 140 hits. But, well, if you've got 12 8-inch guns, and you're capable of thinking and breathing at the same time, and you're unloading a full salvo faster than once every 10 seconds, it's not going to be that difficult uh, to score 140 main battery hits. Shut up and take my money. How do I get Gunter Lutyens as a captain? Well, he's available in the armory for coal. It's not a difficult resource to get your hands on. In fact, it's the second easiest resource to get your hands on in the game, other than credits. So, personally, I've got more coal than I know what to do with. Meanwhile, Runner is experiencing a problem that generally only really afflicts light cruiser captains who don't have the IFHE skill. He's struggling to do damage to a battleship. Except Runner is not in a light cruiser. He's in the Hindenburg, and he's armed with 12 8-inch guns, which generally are high enough calibre when firing high explosive to be able to consistently do damage to whatever battleship they happen to be shooting at. Unless, of course, that battleship's a Kremlin. Yeah. Don't worry. 
Wargaming are aware that the Kremlin is overperforming. They've nerfed its anti-aircraft guns. Yeah, I know, I know, don't look at me, I just work here. Well, he's caught sight of the Kremlin again, and he appears to be on fire. And that wasn't Runner. Must have been somebody else. Um, despite the fact that both teams are even on kills, Runner's team is about 300 points behind. Because they've only just managed to equalise the caps, something that Runner was instrumental in doing here. He's got a Yamato to shoot at and starts angling in in case the Yamato starts shooting back at him, but then the enemy Shimakaze, the last destroyer on the enemy team, gets spotted, so he calls for assistance. I think the friendly Henri, who's probably the one that set the uh, Kremlin on fire, responds with the affirmative, so now this poor guy has got a Hindenburg and an Henri shooting at him. You kind of have to feel for destroyers. I mean, as if aircraft carriers weren't bad enough, the second they get spotted, everybody drops what they're doing and starts shooting at them. The Shimakaze is down. The Henri claimed the kill. Back to the Yamato. Oh, shots incoming from the Yami, and they miss. Runner has popped his spotter plane to aid in visibility. The Yami is on kind of low health, and is still very much hittable. And now he can't see Runner, thanks to the island that he's sailing behind, and also the very handy smokescreen dropped by the Shimakaze that they just sank. There are the Shimakaze torpedoes, spotted well in advance. I think they may have been spotted by the Worcester? But it doesn't really matter because Runner's using his Hydro, and German Hydro is absolutely amazing. And he was expecting the torpedoes anyway, so there's no danger that those are going to hit him. Although there might be an issue for the Grosser Kerr first behind him, who will still see the torpedoes, but is a much bigger ship and is much more difficult to manoeuvre out of the way. Oh, he's on that side. Yeah, he's going to be fine. Momentarily spotted by enemy dive bombers, but while well, the Yamato's sailed into cover is now too close to the island to be able to do anything about it, and those dive bombers are running into the AA envelope of a Hindenburg and a Grosser Kerr first, so they shouldn't be too much of a threat. However, that's really the only good news, because the enemy Worcester has managed to sink another Grosser Kerr first, and the Montana over there has just sunk the Henri IV, so the team are still behind by over 400 points. They've got a lot of catching up to do, and Runner's going to start with the Montana, who's heading straight for an island. And on very, very low health and getting focused down. I don't know if you noticed, but Runner keeps calling out priority targets here. It's unusual for the team to actually pay attention, but this team is actually paying attention. He's also playing with his throttle uh, to try to throw off the aim of anybody who happens to be targeting him. Montana looked like he was about to beach on the island, but died before that happened. Good stuff. Both teams are once again even on kills, but despite the kill on the Montana, a runner's team are still well over 300 points behind. Now, whose torpedoes are those? It can't be the Worcesters. He doesn't have torpedoes. There's a Yoshino down there. But, oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. Those are the noob tube torpedoes. Those are the Type 93s with 20 kilometer range that get spotted from low Earth orbit. So despite the fact that Hydra wasn't running, he saw them coming from a country mile away. Unfortunately, the team have just lost yet another ship. The friendly Worcester has gone down, taken out by the Kremlin. What Kremlin's that? Uh, that would be this one. Now, you might be thinking this qualifies as a bit of an oh shit moment. And you're right, but it's worse than that because the Yamato's behind him. The enemy team are at over 930 points with a one kill lead. You really don't want to be turning away from these guys because they will rape your broadside. So it's time for Runner to strap on his man pants and go for it. Luckily, the Yamato is backing away because he knows he's on low health and Runner is concentrating his guns on the Yamato and using the torpedoes on the Kremlin, the first set of torpedoes have missed, but, well, the Hindenburg gets lots of torpedoes on both sides. He helps them out with a point-blank range, armor-piercing salvo, and kills a Kremlin. Yes, really, that happened. <laughs> and the Yamato has also gone down. Here comes the Yoshino. Now, that Yoshino just squandered a golden opportunity to change the outcome of this battle, because he ducked in behind the island, which meant that he couldn't shoot while Runner was engaging the Yamato and the Kremlin. And now that he's behind the island, 
He can't fire his torpedoes either. But I honestly don't know what it is about Yoshino captains. It's like they have to prove that they're different from the Azuma at tier 9 by showing off their torpedoes. So this guy gives flat broadside. <laughs> which Runner is only too happy to exploit by switching to all the piercing shells in order to try to get around the lip of that island there just so he could get his torpedoes away and, well, didn't work out too well for him, did it? Despite the 271,000 damage and 4 kills and 1 capture assist, the team are still 150 points behind. But Runner's finally got that midway right where he needs him. Now he has to fire armor piercing, of course because carriers are basically immune to fires and the midway has an armoured deck so it's basically immune to high explosive shell damage as well. Why is that Jingles? Well you didn't hear it from me but apparently aircraft carrier players are too stupid to be able to understand that the damage control consumable is for their ship and not for their aircraft. It's nice to know that Wargaming have such faith and confidence in the intelligence of their player base isn't it? I mean, okay, there were other reasons as well, if I'm being completely fair, but um, yeah, damage control is too hard was definitely one of them. And as always, cool ships don't look at explosions. There goes the midway. Crack it unleashed. 320,000 damage done. Hello, Mr. Worcester. Do you want some of this? The Worcester looked for a second as if he was going to turn to bring all of his guns to bear, then realised, what the hell am I thinking? That's a Hindenburg. He will have the armour piercing loaded. And he does have the armor piercing loaded, realizes his mistake, corrects it, and runs straight into the island in the process. Which is really good news for Runner, because the Wooster puts out some serious high explosive damage per minute when it can bring all of its guns to bear. And because of that, it can't bring all of its guns to bear. It doesn't hurt that Runner's on low health and the adrenaline rush skill has also kicked in which means that his guns are probably reloading something like every six seconds now. Um, to be honest, at that kind of angle, with a flat arse of the Worcester, he could probably have loaded armour piercing, penetrated the stern, and maybe citadeled him. Maybe he could, maybe he couldn't. But if he hadn't, it didn't work. The Worcester would have probably killed him. So instead, he just stuck to the high explosive and made sure of things. And that just leaves one enemy ship and the enemy team are no longer ahead on points for the first time in this game. That's what it took. <laughs> Six kills, 345,000 damage, one capture assist and the high caliber award. That's what it took to finally take the points lead over this enemy team. And it wasn't that his team played badly either, at least not from what we've been able to see at least. Um, the enemy team did make a bit of a a mess of that initial encounter over on the western flank, but they cleaned up everywhere else. Uh, this was a fight between two fairly evenly matched teams, right up until when it wasn't. And it wasn't mostly because of, okay, he's calling himself Gamebred TV now, but he'll always be runner 357 in my eyes. Oh, and there we go, there's another capture assist. That guy's got to be feeling pretty pissed off. <laughs> they haven't exactly snatched defeat from the jaws of it. Well, uh, have they? They were up to about 952 points not that long ago. Uh, right up until the point where Rudder decided he was going to go for it and YOLO'd the Kremlin and the Yamato. And that was probably the flipping point. That's where this match changed. He just went for it. Wouldn't recommend doing that in the Minotaur. <laughs> Hell, I wouldn't even recommend doing it in the Hindenburg. But it needed to be done. And so he did it. And uh, and that was a win from Gamebred TV, the artist formerly known as Runner357, in the just all-round excellent German Tier 10 heavy cruiser, the Hindenburg. I hope you enjoyed it, and as always, take care, and I'll catch you next time.